Good morning. It's such an honor to be here. Um, yeah, I could go on and on about that. What a special church this is. I travel all around. Uh, it's one of the things that I do these days. I have been planted most of my life in Tulsa. Uh, I've planted churches, planted a church, was a part of a church plant in Dallas, planted a church in Los Angeles. Now I travel around and I speak. I work with my dad uh, serving pastors out in uh, Nawada, Oklahoma. I'm sure you've all heard of that and you're, you're very aware of Nawada. It's a thriving metropolis, one stoplight. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's so good to be here. It's so good to be here. Uh, I want to I thank you, Pastor Jacob, uh, the Howell family. This is a familial call, the church. It's not an easy thing to say yes to God when he says, I want you to pastor a church, especially when it's not necessarily your context. Maybe you wonder if you have the gift to do it, but you are compelled. You are compelled, and I commend you for your faithfulness and obedience, and I see the fruit of it. I mean, what a special thing. What an unbelievable space this is. I'm so excited for where you're going. What an incredible thing that will be. And uh, it's, an honor. it's an honor to be here with you. I could talk about that for a while, but I have limited time, and I have something that I need to say. I want to talk to you about thriving in a time of unrest. I want to talk about our response as Christ followers when the world around us seems unstable and how do we thrive? How do we do great things for God and live a satisfied life when there's unrest in the world around us? Social unrest, political unrest, economical unrest, there's moral decay. Sometimes it can feel difficult to fulfill the call of God and to especially move outside of our comfort zone and take ground for God when things around us feel like it's just a waterbed and we're just trying to stay on our feet. And the tendency whenever things are unstable is to want to batten down the hatches and put a gate up around our community. But God has called us to be assertive. God has called us to move forward, to take ground. Even in times like this, when it feels like things are decaying. And before I get into the message, I just want to set your expectation. In Ephesians, Paul says that Jesus has given gifts, the gift of the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the apostle, the evangelist. I want to highlight just for a second this gift of evangelism. It's a gift that I feel like that I operate in. And most of the time, whenever, especially if you are in the church, grown up in the church, understand what these gifts are, to some degree we would think, okay, evangelism is just moving people from the lost category into the found category, and that's certainly true, but really what an evangelist is is a, is a bringer of good news, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news to you, not just for salvation, but to every area of your life, and so what happens is we stand in the presence of holiness, in the presence of truth, and that truth has the possibility, if we allow it in, to change our lives, not just salvation, which is certainly not a small thing, but to move us forward in the places where we feel stuck. And so I just want to set your expectation that this morning there is a gift of evangelism in the room. It, isn't, it is certainly not me, but it's something that I've noticed that God moves people forward. And so my goal and desire for you today is that you would take a step that you would take a step. It's really easy to come into church, and I've done it. I've been in the church my whole life. My dad started the church in 1987 in Tulsa. Before that, we were in the church. I was raised in the church, born in the church. I've always been in the church, and if we're not careful, what happens when we come in on Sunday, especially if it is our custom, it can become somewhat white noise to us where we just hear these things and we hear these phrases and, and we know these things and we can kind of check out a little bit and our expectation maybe is that we would do the thing that we know we're supposed to do and show up. But what will God do? Is there the possibility of something supernatural? Is there the possibility of something transcendent? Because I would say that really we're here for the transcendent. I mean, if we're being honest, we need something more than just physical. You need more than just me being here. I mean, I know that you can already tell, like, this is going to be incredible because, I mean, just one, look at this guy, and two, you know, listen to him talk. It's just like, wow, you've never even heard anything. Words put together. I mean, I get it. But you need power. <laughs> and if it's just me, then this is not going to be very good. It's not going to be great. Because you need something transcendent. We need God. 
We need God. And so that's why I draw attention to the gift given because that is the hope and the plan of Jesus Christ to the church to move us forward, that the gospel would meet us where we're at. And so I would say, where are you at? Where are you at? Is there a, a space in your life where you know, you know what, I feel a bit stuck? I feel stuck. And if you feel stuck in some capacity or lethargic, you've lost your passion a little bit, not your belief, but your passion, and you're just wondering, how do I proceed? What is my next step? I need guidance. Whatever it is, we're going to pray, and I believe that God will move you forward if you allow him in. So before I get into it, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. You're so good. You love us, Lord, even when we are unlovely. You are faithful even when we are unfaithful. Your mercy is unbelievably enduring. I thank you for truth. I thank you for the power of your word. Your word has the ability to create new life in places where it seems like life is impossible. You know what we need. And so we invite you in. Jesus, you stand at the door of our heart and you knock and we unlock it and we open it and we say, have your way. Do what you will do. Give us a simple step, Lord. Speak to us, your spirit to ours, so that we will know how to proceed. Give us a single step. That's how you lead us in steps. So that we can walk out of here, not the way we came in, but that we can walk out with a plan and with confidence that you are moving us forward to the better life that you have for us. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. It's interesting because in the first chapter of Scripture, we have the mission of God for mankind laid out. God's plan for humanity. God made mankind in his image. And then he says, multiply my image on the earth. There's a physical component to that for sure. Multiply. Be fruitful. Multiply. But there's also this supernatural component. Multiply what? My image. It's not just your physical body is made in the image of God. Is that you are a representative of the image of God. And that we are to multiply that image. This is known as the mission of God. You see it echoed in Genesis 9 when Noah gets off the ark and the earth is empty except for he and his family. God says, be fruitful and multiply. The plan of God has not changed. The mission of God is the same. He says this to Abraham in Genesis 12. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will multiply you on the face of the earth. Jesus comes to the earth Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus is resurrected. And before Jesus ascends to heaven, Jesus says this to his disciples in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is not making an adjustment. The church is a fulfillment of the mission of God stated in Genesis 1. The plan of God was known before the foundation of the world, and Jesus came to fulfill it. Go make disciples. What is that? Go multiply the image. Multiply the image of God. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the image of God being multiplied now through the church. This is our commission that we as a church would not just come in and work on our own sanctification. Our sanctification is how are we becoming more like Jesus. A lot of people get stuck, especially within church. We get stuck moving forward to the mission of God where the image of God moves to us and through us. We get stuck because we feel like we're unworthy vessels to relay the image of God. We spend most of our lives working on ourselves. There are things I've got to do, things I've got to overcome, things that I'm not good at yet, things I'm not sure that I can do. So I'm really most concerned with me and am I doing what I need to do? And the part of multiplying it out is the job of other people. 
But it's our job, as commanded by Jesus here, go, make disciples of all nations. Jesus ascends to heaven, and in Acts 2, the church is born. The church is born in Jerusalem, and then the church is persecuted. And when it's persecuted, it disperses. And in Acts 9, a man named Saul, who was a chief persecutor, converts. Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus, changes his name to Paul, and Paul goes out and begins to multiply the image in the Gentile, the non-Jewish territory around him. He preaches in many places, and most places he goes, he is met with persecution. He's beaten, he's imprisoned, the message is opposed everywhere he goes. Most of the places he goes, the message is opposed by the Jews living in Gentile territory. In Acts 18, he shows up to Corinth. Corinth is a large city. He goes to where the Jewish population is. He goes to the synagogue. He preaches the Jewish Messiah to them. They become hostile to him and even blasphemous. The scripture says he shakes off his clothes as if to say, look, I have done my part. I have stated truth to you and you don't want it. So I'm moving on. Jesus appears to Paul in a vision in Acts 18, 9, and 10. And I see a formula, I see a framework for us as to how we live the life God has called us to live on this earth. Acts 18, 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack you. And harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Jesus says three things to Paul. Three things to Paul to keep him moving, to renew his sense of commission. I hope today to renew your sense of commission. We have been commissioned and it is easy to take our eyes off it. But these words of Jesus in a vision to Paul renew his sense of of commission, he ends up staying in Corinth another year and a half preaching the message. Three things. The first one is this. His presence is your power. His presence is your power. In an uncertain, unstable world, the presence of Jesus is your power source. He says this to Paul. He says, do not be afraid. Why? I'm with you. That is your reason and your cause to not be afraid in an unstable world. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I think it was 1987. Um, My dad took my older brother, Whitney, who's two and a half years older than me, my, my younger sister, Charity, two and a half years younger than me, took us to see one of the great films in cinematic history, Rocky IV. Um... I don't know why we're laughing, because it is that. It is a tremendous... Now, if you're having a difficult time delineating uh, between the many Rocky films, Rocky IV is the one where he goes to Russia, and he fights the great Russian Ivan Drago, and and he effectively uh, brings world peace through an unintelligible speech at the end, just brings nations together. Uh, And I, as I think I was eight years old, I was mesmerized by this movie, not because of the socio-political issues, but because of the, the boxing and mostly the Russian. I love the Russian. I don't know if that was appropriate to say then, especially in the height of the Soviet Union or even now for that matter, but I love the Russian. And I went home and I thought I want to, I was inspired. I had blonde hair growing up when I was younger, blonde hair. The Russian had blonde hair and he had this flat top, this awesome flat top. Now, believe it or not, in the 80s, the flat top was a progressive look uh, for a Christian kid, the son of a pastor. And I was afraid that if I asked my dad if he would allow it, that he would not let me. But I was so inspired by this Russian. And physically, I looked nothing like him. I was much shorter and a little bit pudgy. And, and I thought, well, how can I, how can I follow my role model here in, into the future? And it was like, well, I'll work on my hair. So I just went, sh- after the movie, straight to the showers got my hair wet, then got my mom's blow dryer, which I had never operated before. And I spent like an hour blow drying my hair, which was not cut to flat top length, but blow drying it up, just up. <laughs> I looked more like Beaker from the Muppets <laughs> by the end. I thought I, thought I looked fantastic. I, I thought this is, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out to my parents and I'm going to say, do you see what, we, yeah, you see. So 
Now we can maybe cut it flat. What do y'all say? So I go out to my parents, and I'm just, I'm glowing. And they just, go get your hair wet. Don't ever do that again. So kind of squashed my dream a little bit. But then I thought, okay, now next step is box. I want a box. I want a box. I'd seen enough in the movie where I felt like now I know how to box. So I go to my dad, and I say, hey, dad, will you buy Wit and I boxing gloves? He was very eager uh, to fulfill this request. Uh, he went to Toys R Us to buy us boxing gloves. Now, just side note, Toys R Us, not in business anymore, probably because they don't actually sell real boxing gloves. They sell, like, they're like red isotoner mittens that say Everlast on them. They pose as boxing gloves, and this is what my dad bought us, like one-ounce gloves. We get home. He moves the furniture in the living room. He was very committed to this violence between my brother and I. He moves the couches out of the way, and he says, all right, wait, you're going to be over here. Gabe, you're going to be over here. I'm the referee. All right, I'm going to ring a bell. When I ring the bell, you come together and you fight. And then when I ring the bell, you stop fighting. Do you understand? All right, yes. As I put on the gloves, I remember just being overwhelmed with a feeling of hatred for my brother because he <laughs> beat me up all the time. He was bigger than me, and he beat on me often. And this just felt like it was sanctioned revenge. Like, I am gonna, I have seen it in the movie. Like, I know what I'm going to do. It's going to be awesome. My dad stands in the middle. You ready? You ready? Yes. He goes, all right, ring the bell. He rings the bell. I honestly don't remember moving. I remember my brother charging towards me and wailing on me. And I, I quickly go down fetal position like this, and he's still wailing on me. I begin to cry. The adrenaline, just the pain, I begin to cry and, all, and really bawl. Uh, I'm bawling. And I'm kind of looking at my dad out of the corner of my eye because he's the ref, and he sees that this isn't going well, and he's laughing at me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you are the suckiest referee of all time. I eventually turn around and I move backwards, like my back is turned, I'm in the fetal position, my brother is chasing me, and he's just beating me, and I hear no bell. I eventually end up on the hearth of the fireplace, and I'm crawling in to the <laughs> fireplace by the time my dad stops the fight. And I just remember thinking, why, why won't you stop this? Like, you can see that I'm being pulverized here. Stop the fight. Like, stop the fight. I just... I bring that to your attention because I feel that for many of us, we have seasons of life where we feel strong, we feel capable, and we're moving towards whatever is in our future with some level of confidence. But what often happens to us is we get knocked down to size by unexpected circumstances or experiences, things that begin to derail us from moving forward in the plan that we have laid out for ourselves, we're feeling good about it, and then we're thwarted. And in those times where we're being knocked down, our tendency is to kind of take cover. We go down, we take cover, and then really what we're doing when we come to God is we're saying, God, kind of looking out of the corner of our eye, stop the fight. Stop the fight. I think even nationally we can say this, or even just globally we can say this. There are times when we get the news, the news cycle is so constant and it is so negative, and there are times when it's just like, man, the unrest is so significant, and we honestly thank God that we live in this part of the world where we're not touched by it the same way, but we are touched by our own personal experience and pain and struggle, and we say to God, stop the fight. I know that there are people in the room today who you're Heart cry is, God, ring the bell. Ring the bell so I can go back to my corner. I can regroup. Like, I need a minute. I need a break. The hits just keep coming, and I need a break. And you just want to pause, breathe, gather your strength, then get back up again, and then you'll have the strength to continue. The presence of Jesus is your power, and it is not so that you can always go back to the corner and regroup. We regroup when we're doing things in our strength, and it isn't to say that God doesn't have pause for us, that we fight a battle and then there's rest. But many of us are down like this when we should be up fighting. I've thought about that. When I tell the story of the boxing, I think about, I go back and I'm like, you know what? When I look back now as a much larger human, 
I don't look back and think, gosh, I, I wish my dad would have stopped the fight. I, I honestly, in some sick sort of sadistic way, I wish I could go back now knowing what I know and really just in the physical strength that I currently possess and have another crack at it with my brother. <laughs> And what I want you to know is that God isn't going to necessarily always ring the bell. Because ringing the bell isn't what you need. What he wants to do is he wants to teach you how to fight. We're not called to be rescued out of water. We're called to walk on it. This is who we are as followers of Jesus. But in order to do that, we have to have his presence with us. And Jesus said, I'm with you always. I will never leave you. Jesus is here, but our awareness of his presence is what determines whether or not we move forward with any measure of confidence into an unstable world or unstable circumstances. And the only way we're going to tap into power is whenever we are tapped into the presence of God. And here's the presence of Jesus. It's his word. It's his word. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus said, abide in me, and my words will abide in you. A lot of us lack power because we lack presence. We have belief, but we're not really living in faith. Belief is, I believe something exists. I believe a statement is true. Faith is when you put action to your belief. And faith comes as you develop a relationship with Scripture. It comes as you hear this word. Hearing this word gives you confidence to put your full weight on it. And so I want to encourage you that the presence of Jesus is your power. If you find yourself in a place where you feel depleted, you don't know what to do, or you feel like you're in this on your own and you're waiting for the bell to ring, let me just encourage you, double down on your time reading this book. And you may say, you know what, I do that, but I don't get it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. The scripture is something that as you engage it, the more you do, the more you understand. It doesn't always just come to immediate life. As soon as you pick it up and you read your one chapter a day and you go, I did it. I don't know why I'm not living in power. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to apply it. That is faith, putting your weight on God. His presence is your power. The second thing that I see here in this verse in Acts 18, 9 and 10 is this. His plan is your purpose. His plan is your purpose. He says this to Paul. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. There is a lot of talk in culture today about purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. The world has adopted the idea that we are made for a purpose. It's interesting because they've adopted it, but outside of the plan of a creator for the most part. Maybe there is some sort of energy source or it's the universe, whatever it is, we are made for a purpose. There is something in us that is desperate for impact. And the thing in you that is desperate for impact is the DNA of your creator. There's the awareness that you were made for more. God is always working. God is working on big things. His DNA is in you. And you are not made to just sit on the bench. You are made specifically, designed for a specific reason. And more than that, you have been given specific gifts. Every one of you have been given gifts by God for His purpose. But here's the thing. There's an awareness of the gifts, or at least there's a desire for gifts from God, but they will never be fulfilled and will never live satisfied unless we order those gifts and our design under his plan. So a lot of us try to fulfill purpose outside of the plan of God. We have ambition, we have desire for more, and we go off this way to try to figure it out and find it. And what happens whenever you seek purpose outside the plan of God is you always just end up in a cul-de-sac. It's just a dead end. And you can see this in culture with people who have been given much. They have gifts that are known, they're on a platform, they've been given money, they have significant resource, but they're unhappy, and they're just constantly searching for something to fulfill them. How do we thrive when things are unstable? We live according to our design. We have to live according to our design because it's the only place, one, you'll find peace, which is what we seek, peace. 
and satisfaction for our souls where we know there's a tuning fork moment in your heart where you know I am moving and operating according to the will of God in my life. Like this is just right. The first time I ever preached, I was horrified. It's scary. It was in Church on the Move in Tulsa. The church my dad started, the auditorium was 2,500 seats. Big room. I got up and I said everything that I had planned to say. I had planned like a 30, 35 minute message. I went through it in 17 minutes. <laughs> it was a Wednesday night and I'm like, let's pray. And everyone's looking at me like, what in the world are we doing? But they're also smiling because no one ever complained that a message was only 17 minutes long. No one. They're like writing letters to the church. Like, we love it when Gabe speaks. Maybe he could speak every week. You know, <laughs> like I got stuff to do. We love this guy. And so I got up and I spoke. And I remember feeling, one, so glad that it was over. But two, there was a part of me that was like, you know what? Even though that was nerve-wracking, when I was up there, there was a part of me that's like, I'm, I know that I'm doing what I need to be doing. Whenever you find purpose and you tap into it, it isn't that it's easy. It's just there's something in it that you're like, you know what? I know I know that this is where I'm meant to be. I know that I'm meant to find a a sense of home in this place that God has given me. You have been given gifts by God. Irrevocable gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11 says this, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, for the mission of God. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. You each have been given gifts by God, very personal to your design and purpose. The place where you will find fulfillment in your life is when you submit those gifts to God's plan. And let me just tell you a great place to start here at this church. A lot of the time we resist being engaged in simple ways that don't seem to be very impactful. I know this as you all move out of this building, which you're certainly, I I mean, there's, I don't know why you have tons of space in here. But anyway, as you move into a new space and make room for more people, there is a need for more of you to come on deck. Not just physically, but even financially. There's a need for you to get into this game. And a lot of us resist simple steps, especially when it's like, hey, we need help. We need help where? We need help in kids. We need help in the parking lot. We need help in all different spaces of this church so that we can be hospitable, which is spiritual. We can be aware that there are people coming. We can show them that we care. We can show them that we're ready for them. A lot of the time we resist those things because those things don't seem to be moving us in the direction that we need to go. But what's amazing about God is whenever he's speaking to your purpose, often what he'll do is he'll say, you go that way. But you would say, but but God, I feel that my purpose is actually moving this way. Like that seems like the way to progress. And God will say, I have purpose for you, but you don't get there by going there. You get there by going here. And a lot of us resist these little steps because they just seem small. And there are opportunities to engage here. And many of us like, hey, I'm committed to Merge Church. But there are offerings all the time of ways you can get involved. And you say, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I can't. I can't do it, but I'm committed. But I would say that it is a place for you to submit your gift to the mission and the work of God on the earth. And you say, well, one step doesn't seem like much. And you're right. But one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other, eventually turns into a great distance. And there are parts and pieces of the Spirit of God in you that you have to tap into in a different way, in a way that is uncomfortable, in a way that pulls on your schedule a little bit, pulls on your pocketbook a little bit. But you will never overcome and get to a place of freedom and trust with God where you're putting your full weight on Him if you are unwilling to do uncomfortable things. Purpose is found in following God through uncomfortable places. 
Because there you see, when you submit your gift, you see him use it in a way that transcends your ability to use it. And this is when we tap into satisfaction. This is how we live in an unstable world. This is how we thrive. His plan is your purpose. My last point is this. His people are our priority. He says this to Paul. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. No one is going to attack you to harm you. I have many people in this city. I have many people in this city. My wife, Summer, is from Palm Springs, California. And I met her out there. Well, actually, I met her in college at Oral Roberts University. Went out there after we had been dating for a few months. I went out there to visit her in August between freshman and sophomore year of college. And I learned quite quickly that visiting Palm Springs, and really her family lives in a place called Palm Desert, visiting the desert in the summer is a mistake. And that truth is found in the name, right? It's a desert. And I don't recommend going to the desert in the summer. The desert out there, it gets to be about 125 degrees in the summer. And if you go out there and you're around these people, they say, it is hot. Yes, it's hot, but it's a dry heat. Dry, dry heat. And to that I say, that's crap. <laughs> 125 feels like, well, it's not hell, but you're in the parking lot. That's what 125 feels like. <laughs> One morning we were out there, I was with my son, Charlie. He's 19 years old. We went to go work out, got done working out, walked outside, and you walk outside and the heat just hits you like an oven door is open. It's unbelievable. Go out and get in the car, start the car, can't leave because the steering wheel's leather, the seats are leather, and it's just, it's been baking inside. And so we're just sitting there, you know, with our legs up, arms up, really working on our core, uh, but got to wait for the car to cool down. While we're sitting in this parking lot waiting, I look and see out of the business next to the gym, a man walks out. I notice him because he's got a big old white ratty shirt on, big old dirty jean shorts, white socks, no shoes. He's walking across the concrete, and it doesn't take long to deduce. He's homeless. He'd gone into the business to get out of the heat, to ask for water, use a restroom, whatever he walks across the sidewalk, and then he hits the asphalt. And when he hits the asphalt, he starts gingerly moving across the parking lot because it's just so hot on his bare feet. I'm sitting in the car. I don't say anything. My son doesn't say anything, but I know I have to do something about this, even though I don't want to, honestly. I don't want to. I want to go back. I want to get clean. I want to eat. And I don't want to engage in an uncomfortable situation. I had many encounters with the homeless when I lived in Los Angeles. Most of them didn't really seemed to be very fruitful. But as I watched him, I thought, this isn't right. It's not right. It's not right that someone should have no shoes out here, and so we're going to fix this problem. And I told my son, I said, hey, we're going to go across the street and get this guy some shoes real quick. Is that okay? And he was all too eager to do it. So we run across the street. I grab him some athletic slides. I don't know what size shoe he would wear. He was probably about 5'10 or so, and so I got him a size 11 and some new socks. Go pick him up, go find him. It took me a while to find him. He was sitting at a bus stop. I parked my car in the bus parking area. I jump out of the car real quick, thinking this would be a quick encounter, that we would move through this quickly, which was what I wanted. I'm like, look, I got to do my good deed, help this guy, and then we'll, we'll go. I walk up to him, and I'm like, hey, man, what's up? And he's like, hey. And he had these crackers, like a sleeve of rich crackers in his hand and a bottle of water, and he was just mowing down these crackers and had this real, like, kind of breathy, halting way of communicating. He's like, hey, what's up? And it just, Pah. when you do that, the, uh, the cracker dust just, <laughs> and this was like 2021. It's like, so you could, you know, COVID, you could see it. You could see it coming in the dust, which was helpful because you could dodge it. So I stepped out of the way. I let it pass. And I said, I bought you some shoes. And he's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, just, shh. so I wait. I hand him off, and I'm like, my name's Gabriel. He's like, my name's Michael. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's good to see you again down here, you know. 
I set the bag down thinking that Michael would take the shoes out and immediately put them on, but he didn't seem to be too interested. He was very grateful, but he just wasn't motivated to see what was in the bag. He just kept working on his crackers and drinking his water and talking to me. And I realized after about five minutes, if I don't, if I don't do this, I'm not going to be able to get out of here. Like, I'm going to have to see if these fit because I got to know if they fit before I can leave. So I pull the slides out of the bag. I get down on my knee. I go to put it on Michael's foot. It's a real Cinderella moment because I don't know who Michael's parents are, Shaq and somebody else, but he's, not, he's about 5'10", but he like huge feet, huge. The, the slide does not fit. And I'm like, please, just get on there. I want to, I'm done. Like, I want to be done. I realize it won't fit. I was like, Michael, I got to go get you another pair of shoes. And he asked me, he's like, could you get me shoes? Could you get me shoes instead of slides? And he had some reason for it. I can't remember what it was. And I was like, yeah, I'll get you shoes. And I realized, I don't know if Famous Footwear has size 40. So <laughs> why don't you get in my car and we'll drive across and I'll go get you some shoes. We go across the street, I find Michael some shoes. I get in the car and I was like, where do you wanna go, man? Tell me where you wanna go. He gives me an address, it's like 15, 20 miles away. And I'm like, oh, no worries. It, gas is only $6 a gallon. I don't, it, what, you wanna go on a road trip, Arizona? I'm happy to, we'll camp, whatever, you know, we'll do it. And the whole time I'm thinking, why am I here, God? Why am I here? I came here to do something good just to help this guy out because I'm compelled to. But the whole time I'm with Michael, I'm also praying to God, God, if you want to do more, I'm willing. I'm not comfortable at all, but I'm willing. I'm willing, but you're going to have to open the door for me. Help me open the door for me. I begin going to the place that Michael wants to be dropped off and in the car I'm just sitting there and I'm listening to him and I just finally decide, you know what God? I, I'm just gonna be bold. What do I have to lose? I told Michael, I said, Michael, I'm a pastor from Oklahoma and I believe God sent me here to buy you some shoes, to tell you that he's not mad at you, he loves you and he's not done. And the back of my car, Michael, he broke, broke down. He's bawling in the back seat of my car. My son and I are sitting there just quietly. He starts crying out to God in the back of my car, God, forgive me. Have mercy on me. He starts telling me about his story. He was raised in a Christian home, or it seemed to be a Christian home. His dad was very religious, but also extremely abusive. At 15, he ran away from home. He said he joined a gang. He said, I've made a lot of bad decisions. I started doing drugs. He said, I'm still on drugs. I just listened to Michael because I gathered that no one had listened to him in a while. We drove and drove, and finally we got to the place he wanted to be dropped off, which was just a U-Haul. It was just a U-Haul parking lot. He had nowhere to go. But I get there, and I get out of the car. Michael gets out of the car and Michael comes up to me and he grabs me and he hugs me and he holds me and he cries on my shoulder. And I'm thinking, if you would have told me an hour ago, because that's how long I've been with Michael, an hour ago, that I would be in a U-Haul parking lot in Indio, California, and a homeless guy would be bawling on my shoulder, I would say, I doubt it. But yet here I am. And to be honest, I was floored by the work of God. He's hugging me and he just keeps saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I told him, I said, Michael, if you ever doubt the love of God, I just want you to look at your feet. You just look down at your feet. I get in my car. I start to drive away. Before I turn out of that parking lot, I roll my window down. I'm going to yell one more thing back to Michael. I don't remember what, but as I roll my window down, I will never forget this. He's walking with his back to me. He has his bag in one hand and those crackers, which never seem to end in the other hand and he's walking and as he walks he looks down at his feet he's just looking down as he walks and eventually he starts doing this and he's yelling to whoever can hear him look at my shoes look at my shoes and I thought unbelievable God 
You have given this man something to be proud of, and you've attached it to yourself. And this was not my plan today. Jesus said to Paul, keep speaking, don't be silent. Why? I have many people in this city. Corinth was a wicked city. Corinth was not a godly place. You would have never walked around Corinth and saw disciples of Jesus ready for the picking. Jesus says, I have many people here, but what Jesus doesn't tell you is which ones they are. You have to engage people as if they could be living next to you in eternity forever. Most of the time what we do is we find ourselves just looking at the world in disgust. We see people's fiber and we just keep scrolling. Idiot. Moron. I can't, what is wrong with these people all around us? And we insulate ourselves. But you have been commissioned. You are designed to be commissioned. You will never tap into the satisfaction of your plan and purpose if you do not move towards the commission of Jesus, which is external from you. This isn't just about your own personal sanctification. That's certainly a huge part of it. But also, it's, is Jesus coming to you, but is he going through you? Now, church, is a time for us to engage in our mission. And our mission isn't just our work for God. It is the satisfaction and the gift of God's goodness to us. Because there's nothing you will find out there that will satisfy you like fulfilling your purpose for God. And you can't do it without His presence. And when you have His presence and you know God is with you, you can step out into uncomfortable situations because you've been given gifts. What you've been given is supernatural. It transcends you. And you'll find yourself in places as you engage other people outside of you where you see the work of God going through you. And you marvel. But the plan of God is present now. This is how we live the life we're called to live. And you are in a great place to do it. This church is special because obviously God is moving here. But it isn't just about how these walls grow wider. It is so that you can be equipped for the work of ministry. That's why we're all here. That's why these people come up and lead you in worship. That's why Pastor Jacob preaches messages. It is for you to do the work of ministry. We have a part, but you have a part. Are you engaged in mission? Would you bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the gift and the opportunity to relay your word. Your word is power. Your spirit is at work here. Your spirit is moving. And I thank you for moving in personal ways. You speak to us in a way that we can understand. You move us and you give us steps. Lord, reveal to us the step. Help us to see, Lord, not to just move on with our lives, but to see and ask, Lord, what's my step? Lord, it's a timid request often because we're unsure of what you'll ask of us. But it's okay because whatever you ask of us, you give us a strength to fulfill. And so we ask you, what is the step you would give to us, Lord? How can we renew our sense of commission by engaging in your presence, understanding that you've given us gifts and prioritizing your people? I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said,